very much, James, and good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. I very much like the little bit about the blue sky and the black sky. That's a nice way uh, of thinking about it. I'd like to begin by uh, thanking Spru for the opportunity to comment um, on Johan's presentation um, on the new Spru innovation strategy, which is clearly in process, but also this overall new direction for Spru, which I think is um, really exciting to hear about. So overall, these Things that we've heard about in the last half an hour, I think, are very exciting and timely uh, developments uh, at Sprue. And I think they have clearly the, the, the potential to bring together both the vision of individual researchers, but also the interdisciplinary skills that Sprue has been so well known for. And I think bringing them together in a collaborative, but also coherent framework for innovation policy is something that offers um, real um, promise. So I think listening to you, Johan, um, I think this is a very, uh, very bold and very broadly cast uh, vision for an innovation policy because I think you bring into it a great many different things which I think will pay uh, rich dividends. Um, now I think you've highlighted very clearly in what you've said um, why an approach to innovation in terms of transformative change, delivering transformative change uh, is needed. You've described a world in transition um, shown by um, persistent economic crises, rising inequalities, challenges beyond the capability of a single nation state, geopolitical shifts and so on, all those consumers you made reference to. And these many challenges, which are obviously national, regional, but also global, are indeed urgent, as you highlighted. And I think those who make policy officials and politicians do need interdisciplinary and long-term analysis, robust evidence uh, to help tackle these things. So I think that is, that is um, well-structured and, and uh, a good place to start. And I think the other thing I would highlight is that in your presentation, you, um, you referred to the need for um, innovation policy to have embedded within it social um, socially desirable objectives, and I think this is a recurrent theme that is important. Um, history shows us that if we have a sort of innovation first, regulation later uh, type of approach, that is not a good way to build public confidence. And of course, incentives for business as well as uh, citizens, policy makers, for example, to make sustainable products and processes um, are crucial, and I think there are a good many examples to show, for example, in the area of sustainability, that sustainable businesses can be good businesses. Now, I want to refer here to one piece of work we did last year in Foresight, and this was about making manufacturing products and processes sustainable, and that was at the heart of some of the evidence that we presented to the Secretary of State, Vince Cable, last year, who sponsored this Foresight report on the future of manufacturing. And I think the example of JCB's Cat Reman uh, program, where, which um, it essentially evolved over two million units being remanufactured back into uh, new machines, is a very good example of what can be done when socially desirable goals make good business sense. And in a similar way, another piece of work we did showed how sustainable intensification of agriculture um, can be achieved uh, uh, in an evidence-based way, both in rich countries and in poor countries. And this was the basis of evidence that we put to uh, both DFID and DEFRA. Now, Johan, you pointed out that you're used to working uh, with long timescales. And I think you emphasize that quite a lot in your talk. And certainly Ben Martin on, and John Irvin obviously pioneered the foresight approach uh, several years ago. And the leadership subsequently shown by the UK government in establishing its own uh, foresight program. I think that's a very important legacy for Sprue that I think you're aware of and you should, you should certainly hang on to. And the challenge for the foresight program, as it is now, as it has been, um, it often brings together hundreds of multidisciplinary experts um, as well as users. Um, it's inside government, but its, it's challenge is to be able to influence policies and strategies. Uh, and that's not as straightforward as it might sound. At the very least, it tries to ensure that decision makers are well informed uh, by the best available advice. But as I'm sure you're, you're aware, um, many people here have written reports and papers yourselves, obviously, producing these reports and papers is never enough uh, to try and influence policy. And influencing and driving policy change to kickstart action at the level of practical policy making uh, is, is really quite difficult, and I think not always that well understood. 
Um, and one success we had, which is illustrative, is working with what was the Technology Strategy Board, now it's Innovate UK. We had a pivotal role in driving the um, establishment of an innovation platform for infectious diseases uh, in animals and humans, and that was 55 million over five years. But it was quite a messy business uh, in making that happen. Um, but again, that's the sort of um, challenge I think many of us face. So in many ways, influencing policy at the practical end is something of an art, which I think requires both persistence, but also being opportunistic. So 20 years on, the Foresight Programme is still in place, it's evolved substantially and it will continue to evolve um, under Sir Mark Wolpert's direction. And for example, new approaches to bringing in different kinds of stakeholders are in play. Now, Johan, you also reminded us about the recent John Day review on horizon scanning in Whitehall. And the horizon scanning centre that we had in Foresight has now merged with the horizon scanning centre uh, in the cabinet office. And there is a, a ca the cabinet secretary, as Jeremy Hayward, chairs an advisory group which oversees the direction of futures work in government. So I think this sends a very strong signal um, of its importance. Now, you also um, identified a number of other options, apart from uh, foresight, as being critical to achieving this transformative change uh, in innovation policy. You mentioned experimentation, building new institutions, reshaping science and engineering education. You also met, you mentioned the, reason, um, the reasons for uh, rethinking the role of the state uh, as also um, the role of demand. So all of these things um, make me think you've cast your vision very widely, which I think will... Um, will, as I say, deliver dividends later. And certainly at the Space Agency recently, I've been very struck by how the uh, configuration and culture of different institutions will remain central to driving ambitious uh, targets for developing new space applications. And the emerging uh, space cluster at Harwell and the new catapult centres that I'm sure most of you are familiar with across the UK um, these, I think, show that government in many ways is moving in the right direction, but clearly much remains to be done. But what I would say is that the development of open policy making as a new approach by government, I think this shows that basically you're pushing at an open door. And I would encourage you and your many colleagues and partners beyond SPRU to reach out to government to build stronger relationships. And these relationships have to be quite deep because people move around a lot in government, politicians change. So it's important to make sure those relationships, I think, can be sustained. And those insights on innovation uh, that I think SPRU researchers can bring can have a really important role in terms of supplying the evidence and insights, understanding future challenges, as well as explaining lessons from the part about what has worked and uh, what has not worked. And there is a ready audience in government, as we know, certainly Mariana's recent work ha has attracted quite a lot of attention. So those, those, the need really for bridges uh, between academia and government, I think, are well known, but so are the barriers, and those barriers are still there, and they're things to bear in mind, that individual uh, government departments sometimes struggle to deal with multifaceted problems, political lifetimes clearly are short, and Problems that are essentially bedeviled by um, uncertainty can be marginalised by um, people who are eager for certainty. So just to conclude then, um, the growing importance, I think, of science and technology in the economy now and in the future has led to the recent ring-fencing of the science budget and the challenge of creating an innovation, a comprehensive innovation policy which builds on this to promote not only economic growth, um, but also, as you've stressed, Johan, to deliver social improvements to improve human welfare, while simultaneously uh, developing a new strategic direction for SPRU. I mean, I think this all together provides a great opportunity for leadership as you approach your 50th anniversary. Thank you. <laughs>